Okay, so um, I guess it's time to start. Um, I feel first I'm very happy to, to be here and have this chance to give this class. Um, the goal of the class is going to be to describe the construction of an invariant called contact homology. It's an invariant of contact manifolds. Um, in the first lecture, though, I just want to give a, a brief overview of the, the general area of contact topology and symplectic topology through the holomorphic curves. Um, I see there are a number of experts in the audience, and I hope this isn't um, too boring for you. Um, but uh, the, the first, I'll sort of give an overview and sort of say what, what the goal is. So uh, let's start with uh, a manifold, odd, odd dimension. And a hyperplane field. So that is a the co-dimension one sub-bundle of the tangent bundle. So just at every point, you give a, a hyperplane subspace of co-dimension one in the, in the tangent space at that point. And they vary continuously. So um, equivalently, or almost equivalently to specifying a hyperplane field, if you can specify um, a non-vanishing one form called lambda, and then C is just the, the kernel of lambda. So it's convenient to have both of these descriptions. Yeah, up, to up to yeah, up to scaling. Yeah, yes. Right. So um, we say C defines a foliation or is integrable if and only if um, d lambda restricted to C is zero. So what this <coughs> means geometrically is that through every point there's um, a co-dimension one submanifold and um, C is just the tangent space to that submanifold. So or if locally the, it, C defines um, or gives charts for Y where um, sort of you have one distinguished coordinate. Um, so C is called a contact structure, or is contact structure. Um, and we can think of this as being, in some sense, the, the the farthest from being a foliation as possible. So it's often called maximally non-integrable, if and only if um, d lambda restricted to c is, is a non-degenerate pairing. So another way of saying that, the way it's usually said, is that lambda wedge d lambda to be n minus 1 is non-zero. So, um, <clears throat> so for example, on R two n plus one, there's this so-called standard um, contact structure, which is the kernel of d z plus Ri squared d phi di. Um, another example on R3, there's a so called over twisted contact structure, which is given by kernel of cosine R dz plus. Yeah, so it's it's polar coordinates in um, R two, the n, and then z here. R sine R d theta. So, uh, so it's a 
a rather non-trivial theorem of Beneken that in dimension three, these are not the same. There, there's no diffeomorphism of R3 taking the standard one to the overtwisted one. Okay, so now um, just a few um, basic facts about contact structures. What are, what are what, how do they uh, behave? So first is Darboux's theorem says that um, every contact manifold is locally isomorphic to R2n plus 1 with the standard contact structure. So contact structure, um, just like a foliation, has no local invariance. Um, it's not like a Riemannian metric. Riemannian metric has lots of local invariance, curvature, um, things like that. All contact structures look locally the same, so they're only sort of interesting questions to ask are global questions, um, which sort of interact with the topology of Y. Another basic result is that if you have um, sort of a path of contact structures, deformation, um, for any, there exists an isotopy from y to itself, such that this Um, deformation of contact structures is induced by the isotopy. So it sounds kind of strange, but let me, um, they're technical, but let me say, say what it means. So one way of interpreting is this is saying that the, or a consequence of this is that um, the moduli space of contact structures is discrete. So if we take sort of the space of all contact structures on Y, For no, sorry, yeah. Because it will contradict the Benikin. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah you could probably. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, so, so why compact? Thank you. Yeah, so on, on a compact manifold, yeah, they're, they're discrete. Um, yeah, so the consequence is that this. Um, is discrete. So in, in some sense, this is a, a, a combinatorial object. You can, you can add, it makes sense to ask the question, what are all contact structures on the given closed three manifold? Um, so Darboux's theorem was sort of the same for contact structures and for foliations. <laughs> Sorry, um, yeah. Um, maybe not, I don't, well, okay, I don't know whether this one can, but yeah, there, there's an overtwisted contact structure on, on S3 and on, on anything. Yeah. The, the, the second one cannot be compact, because it has overtwisted disk outside of every compact subset. This one, okay, okay, so you need a, a different contact for it, okay. Yeah, right. yeah so, so Gray's theorem is, um, is true for contact structures. Um, foliation, this is something which is, fails completely for foliations. Let me just, so to sort of understand what this statement is saying, let me show why it's not true for, for foliation. So there, for, uh, if we look at the torus, then we can define the foliation by picking any slope and looking at just the lines of that slope, any slope. Um, and if you vary the slope lambda, this is a deformation of foliations, which definitely um, does not come from an isotopy. Somehow the foliation encodes uh, the dynamics of this sort of return map by adding by adding adding by lambda on on the circle. So, yeah. so some. 
basic questions we're interested in are sort of existence of contact structures um, classification and symplectic ability and cobordism <coughs> between contact structures. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll define this precisely later. So um, these questions, or existence and classification, um, are completely answered um, by Gromov's H principle on open manifolds. So we say a a manifold is open if and only if every component either has non-empty boundary or is non-compact. So, um, so let Y2N be open. So then the following map is a homotopy equivalence. So we look at the space of all contact structures. Um, and we can map this to the space of just all hyperplane distributions. Um, in dimension three, this is essentially enough up to specifying some orientation. Um, and higher dimensions, we also need to specify some almost complex structure on C. Again, with some <coughs> twisted by some orientation business. But this map is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so wh why, is, why is this sort of called an answer to this question? This space looks perhaps. Um, just as complicated as this one. Uh, the answer is that this is this um, space is described completely um, homotopy theoretically. This is um, there's some Grassmannian of um, of codimension one subspaces of the tangent bundle equipped with some extra structure, and this is just the space of sections of that um, that vibration over the manifold. This also answers the question of classification, exactly contradicts to your example of this <laughs> <laughs> This one, these yeah, are yeah, yeah, it's open manifold, um, but this doesn't. Ah, right. So, so, um, so the, so here we're putting the topology of um, uniform convergence on compact subsets. So, if you're in the same connected component of this, you're not necessarily diffeomorphic. So these are in the same connected component, but not not diffeomorphic. So Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Classification up to up to homotopy in this sense. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. Right. So, th so th this this question uh, these questions are mostly interesting on. Um, are mostly focused on on closed uh, closed manifolds. Okay, so on, on closed manifolds, there's there's somehow there's a version of this statement, although it's um, sort of more involved. So Eliasberg, nineteen eighty nine, and Eliasberg, Murphy, very recently, I think 2014, um, is that so if you look at all um, contact structures um, on a closed manifold, so let's say Y closed, um, then you can, there's a canonical sort of partition of this set. Into, into two 
different spaces called tight and over twisted. And again, there's this map. And um, this is a homotopy equivalence on the set of overtwisted. Um, given some extra marking of the <coughs> sort of overtwisted re region. So, um, right, the point of this is that there are some, there's some class of contact structures which are somehow the contact condition isn't adding anything extra, or um, doesn't add any extra information to the just the plain homotopy theoretic information contained already. And there's this other, so overtwisted ones are sort of completely flexible. Tight contact structures, on the other hand, are, are more mysterious. So this, these, these questions are sort of mostly interesting for, for tight contact structures. They're, they'll turn out to be easy answers for, for overtwisted ones by these results. So, um, I believe an open question whether um, every irreducible free manifold have a tight contact structure. And there are examples of non irreducible three manifolds with no tight contact structures by Etner and Handa. Um, for example, the Two, three, five, point create homology sphere and connect some. It's it's reverse. Doesn't have any tight contact structure. Right. So there's a there's a, a conjecture by Ali Ashberg that um, every Every close three manifold has only finitely many tight contact structures. Um, this turns out to be not exactly true as as stated, um, but um, but it's almost oh, there's sort of a way to correct it to be a true statement. So there's a sort of coarse classification due to Kalan, Shiru, and Honda, 2009. Which states that um, on any, if you have an irreducible and a toroidal three manifold. So, for instance, um, any hyperbolic three manifold or any any hy any any three manifold um, whose sort of Thurston geometrization decomposition consists of only a single piece um, and is not a sort of a it's not one of the e easier to understand pieces. Um, only, ha only has finitely many tight contact structures. Um, and <coughs> if you drop The assumption of a toroidal, um, there could be, there could be. Um, Giroux has found examples of um, toroidal three irreducible three manifolds with with infinitely many tight contact structures. But um, the number of homotopy classes of plane fields you get this way is finite.
Okay, so this is somehow a, a brief, um, very brief overview of some basic results in contact geometry and hope, hopefully shows, shows that there's some, some more interesting questions to be asked, especially in higher, higher dimensions about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it just yeah. So there's some some standard contact form you can write down on the ball, and it's over twisted, and if and only if it has that <coughs> inside. In fact, you can state it even um, even more abstractly. Just for any contact structure on the ball whatsoever, it has that inside, if and only if it's over twisted. So <coughs> let's talk a little bit about um, symplectic geometry. So if you have a manifold X, even dimension, so W is a two form, is called um, symplectic if it's closed and non-degenerate. So the natural notion of cobordism between um, contact manifolds, or one natural notion of cobordism is that of symplectic cobordism, um, which is as follows. So, so x omega is a uh, cobordism from y plus c plus to y minus c minus if um, so the boundary x is y plus disjoint union y minus and um, when you restrict the symplectic form to the boundary this is um, this is d lambda for um, contact forms. <coughs> on y plus minus. Um, and th there's also an, um, an orientation or orientation uh, condition which I, which I won't write, just saying that symplectic form gives x an orientation, that gives its boundary an orientation. A contact structure also gives an a contact form gives an orientation to, to y plus and y minus. It should be the same on y plus and different on y minus. So one should notice that this is definition is not, um, not symmetric with respect to y plus and y minus. Um, there, uh, you can, a cobordism like this is often, often drawn like this, a negative end in the plot positive end. If you have a cobordism from y plus to y minus, it doesn't necessarily go the other way. Um, what, is the, what is the trivial cobordism from a manifold to itself? It's um, y plus zero one with the symplectic form symplectic form. So if you take, um, yeah. so this, this is a cobordism, sort of looks compact. We have these boundary components. You can also attach sort of infinite ends on, on both sides, and that's often a, a convenient geometric um, operation to do. So you can often sometimes 
patch y cross infinity zero and same same up here. All right, so um, just some more terminology. Um, we say y c is fillable if and only if there exists a cobordism from from this to the empty set. So um, a typical <coughs> example is like this, the sphere with a standard contact structure. So if we take S2n minus 1, the unit ball in Cn, um, then it has a contact distribution given by the complex tangencies to, this, to the real hypersurface. Um, in general, if you have a, a real hypersurface in Cn, it has a Levy distribution, the, contact, the complex tangencies to the hypersurface, that's co-dimension one hyperplane distribution, and it's contact if and only if the surface, um, if the hypersurface is strictly pseudo-convex. Just equivalent definitions. Do you agree what to add to the definition of contact structure co-orientation because it's moving evolution? So, because this is you say it's asymmetric. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So this. Yeah. When I guess when you talk about cobordisms, you usually want co-oriented guys. So. Yeah. The sphere with opposite orientation will be. <coughs> Yeah. Will it be itself? Um, I don't know. Okay, so I want to <coughs> now introduce um, pseudo-holomorphic curves. And this is a very fundamental tool in symplectic and contact topology introduced by Grimoff. So, so fix a symplectic manifold, actually, for this. First, sent first sentence, we don't really need the symplectic structure. What I want is an almost complex structure. Um, and now, what we want to consider is maps um, from a Riemann surface into X, um, which are holomorphic in the sense that the, the differential is complex linear. So if you have map from a Riemann surface to X. This is called a holomorphic, if and only if differential is j-linear. So um, usually, uh, okay, so, so to study these, holomorphic <laughs> curves, we usually consider moduli spaces of all holomorphic curves in the given manifold. So for, for instance, um, we can look at the moduli space of stable maps introduced by Konsevich, um, for which is the set of uh, Paris consisting of a uh, nodal Riemann surface and a map from C to X such that um, it's pseudo-holomorphic. We also say fix the homology class. Um, and it should be a uh, finite automorphism group. So um,
So one fundamental property of this moduli space is that um, if j is tamed by a symplectic form omega, which means that omega is positive on complex lines, um, then this space of stable maps, or really any, um, any reasonable moduli space of holomorphic curves, is compact. is one fundamental property of this space. Another fundamental property um, um, comes from the structure of this j holomorphic curve equation. It, this is um, an elliptic equation. And what this tells you is that for sort of under some generosity assumptions, moduli spaces such as this is a manifold. Of a dimension which you can calculate using the index theorem to be So given <coughs> these two facts, the compactness and the fact that this is a manifold. Orbifold. Orbifold, yeah. Um, you can extract um, so-called enumerative invariants out of this. For example, um, so you have fundamental class. And you can, in, in the homology of the moduli space itself, uh, you can push this forward to say, the homology of mg bar. And for instance, if this is 0, then you're just counting the number of, number of curves. So there, um, there's a very rich theory of holomorphic curves in symplectic geometry. Um, but I want to, contact homology is one specific example. Um, so, and I'll, let me just focus on this example. So, um, certain sort of important precursor to contact homology. is Hofer's work on the, on the 3D Weinstein conjecture. So let me say what that is. If you have a, a contact manifold, and let's also pick a contact form. So then, out of a contact form, there's an associated vector field called the, the ray vector field. So R lambda <coughs> ray vector field um, is defined by the properties that lambda of the ray vector field is 1, and d lambda ray vector field is 0. So this defines some flow on the manifold. And the, this flow um, is a flow by contactomorphisms. It, it preserves the contact structure. So 
there's a conjecture of Feinstein, I guess, 1979. Yeah. But on, on any closed manifold. Um, every gray vector field has a closed orbit. And of course, once you ask this question, you can ask many, many other questions, such as um, or what is the growth of the number of rape orbits? Does that have, have more than one? Things like this. Or any sort of dynamical question about this, this flow, positive entropy, things like this. Um, now you might ask, why is the, the contact condition um, important? So um, there's the, the Seifert conjecture that any vector field on, on S3 has a closed orbit. This is false um, by counterexample, counterexamples found by Cooperberg. Um, and in fact, there are volume preserving vector fields um, on three manifolds with, with no periodic orbits. So there's some um, subtle, subtle geometry um, of the contact structure, which is um, conjecturally versus, versus a closed orbit. These are somehow very special, special vector fields. Okay, so um, what Hofer's work on the, what Hofer noticed um, in his work on the 3D Weinstein conjecture is that um, holomorphic curves um, can actually be used to, to construct periodic, periodic orbits of, of ray vector fields. So, um, right. so let's consider a symplectic coordinate zone. Like this. So this is x omega, and recall that the, the top end um, is some contact manifold, and so is the bottom end. So now we're going to attach these, these cones. This y cross y plus cross 0 infinity, and y minus cross negative infinity 0. Okay, and we're going to look at um, holomorphic curves in this in this cobordism. <clears throat> okay, so you can't just look at. So, okay, l let me specify what almost complex structure to use. So we choose a J on this completed cobordism. Um, in the interior, I, I just want it to be tame, tamed by omega condition. Um, but in the ends, or, um, require some conditions. So one that should be, there's this translation action in any end, it should be R invariant. ds, so s is the, the r coordinate. Uh, we want this to equal the, the ray vector field, r lambda. And three, <coughs> um, if you restrict it to the contact structure, this should be um, compatible with d lambda. So there's some technical conditions you need. 
So let's, let's suppose we're looking at holomorphic curves with respect to a normal complex structure satisfying these conditions. <coughs> so what can happen? So this, <coughs> this is not a compact manifold. Um, so, so Gromov compactness doesn't, doesn't apply. If you fix the homology class of, of the curve, <coughs> it might be non-compact. Uh, the moduli space might be non-compact. Um, but so let's see how, how can it be non-compact. So these level sets <coughs> are, are pseudo-convex. So like in this example of S2n minus 1, um, in fact, any, any contact manifold cross R, these level sets are, are pseudo-convex with respect to an almost complex structure satisfying these conditions. So what that means is that the holomorphic curve can't escape to infinity. It's no, not possible to, to be um, tangent like this by a maximum principle. What can happen though is a holomorphic curve can escape to minus infinity. So you can have some, some sequence of holomorphic curves, which look like this. this have your surface, and it sort of sends a, some long finger down, um, down the negative end of the cobordism. And um, you can assign to such a, um, a sequence of holomorphic curves a sort of a, a limit in the sense that what you get is you have, you have your cobordism with, with some curve. And um, this the cylinder, this is a cylinder. And it turns out to be asymptotic. to a rape orbit on the negative end. Um, you can sort of see from the definition of the almost complex structure that if you have a closed orbit of the rape vector field and cross that with R, you get a pseudo-holomorphic cylinder in, in, the, symplecti in the, um, the symplectization in R cross Y. And the cylinder is sort of asymptotic to that trivial cylinder over, over the rape orbit. So in 1993, Hofer used this <coughs> and um, used this proved a, a compactness theorem like this, showed that a degeneration of holomorphic curves and symplectizations allows you to, to find a ray orbit like this um, to prove the Weinstein conjecture in a number of, of cases. So the 3D. I can think conjecture holds for um, mainly over twisted contact structures. Also, any contact structure on the three sphere. Um, so, actually, by a theorem of Eliasberg, there's only one tight contact structure on S3. So there's, for, to get two out of one, you only need to an analyze one more example. And three, um, any manifold, uh, which is not irreducible. So in, in these three examples, you can uh, produce produce a, a sequence of holomorphic curves which, which have, has to be non-compact um, and therefore escape down the, the negative end of, of y cross r.
So go from there. You just go. Yeah. So in, in 2007, <coughs> Tobbs proved um, the Weinstein conjecture for, for three manifolds in general. So. And um, the, the way he proved this was also using holomorphic curves, but using um, a holomorphic curve invariant um, known as known as um, ECH or embedded contact homology to the Hutchings and Tobbs. And in particular, so what, what is this? This is an invariant of contact manifolds, which involves counting embedded um, holomorphic curves in R cross Y. Um, and so there's, there's an isomorphism between the embedded contact homology and monopole Fleur homology, cyber written Fleur homology. Um, and so basically some non-triviality results which are known for in the for cyber written Fleur homology um, shows that ECH is non-zero and this gives this conjecture. Oh I, I actu actually this is I'm I'm stating it a little bit um, inverting the history. This um, Tubbs proved this equivalence after he proved the Weinstein conjecture, but somehow this the Weinstein conjecture, the, the work for this was a sort of the first step in, in proving this equivalence in, in full. Um, but. So in, in higher dimensions, it's um, the Weinstein conjecture is sort of completely open. It's, it's known in a number of examples, a number of special cases, but. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, um, yeah. So. I think it's up with uh, the Hamiltonian dynamics, uh, hoping to find a closed orbit for almost all energy level on a, on a, for a Hamiltonian dynamic system. And then, if you have a, in, in the case where you get a contact manifold doing that, uh, all level sets have the same dynamics, so if you find closed orbit for almost all level sets, then, then they are everywhere. I think this is the path to this conjecture. They, they want to prove the stability of the solar system because they, they hope that the planets don't just collide it to the sun in a thousand years. So I think that's maybe that's the motivation for this conjecture. Okay. So So this is, I guess, now time to tell you what, what contact homology is. So uh, this is an invariant due to Ali Ashberg, given tall Wolfer. Um, the paper um, was published around 2000, but I think the, the idea is somehow goes back to almost immediately after Helfer's first work on this. So let's fix a contact manifold Y and let's also fix a contact form and J will be, I'll just Right, admissible almost complex structure on R cross Y. So what that means is these, these three technical conditions. So it should be R invariant, should send DS to the Rabe field 
and its restriction to the contact distribution should be um, compatible with the lambda. So now we're going to say P is the set of periodic orbits of R lambda. Now, um, what this definition is going to be is we're going to make some chain complex generated by the periodic orbits. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's assume um, uh, non-degenerate. So we're going to um, define a chain complex whose generators are all the periodic orbits with a certain differential defined in terms of pseudo-holomorphic curves. And this is going to turn out um, to be an invariant of the contact structure. So it won't depend on the form or the, or the almost complex structure, just the contact structure. Um, and uh, a corollary of just of the definition of the fact that the definition makes sense is going to be that if we can calculate this invariant and show it's non-trivial, um, we get the Weinstein conjecture. Um, because if there are no periodic orbits, contact homology is just trivial because there's there's no chain complex. So the definition is the following. So we'll look at uh, the free. algebra generated by this, by this set P. Um, well, actually, it's not all of the elements of P. It's some subset. So there's some issue about um, sort of orientations in the somology theory, um, which and, and issue about Rave orbits being multiply covered. And so there's a natural um, partition of the set of rave orbits. Traditionally, <coughs> the two sets are called the good rave orbits and the bad rave orbits. And this chain complex is just generated by the, the good rave orbits. The other um, comment to make here is this is the free, um, the free supercommutative. algebra generated by P good. So these, these, um, these Rabe orbits have sort of an additional discrete invariant. They're either, either even or odd. And so in this algebra, A B is B A times <coughs> super commutative. So odd, odd elements anti-commute. So now, okay, so far we haven't used holomorphic curves. Holomorphic curves are going to define the differential of this complex. So uh, for gamma, gamma plus in P good, I need to tell you what the differential of this is. The differential is going to depend on the choice of almost complex structure. So we're going to take the sum over um, overall finite subsets of good ray orbits. We're going to look at number of elements in this moduli space. the holomorphic curves in R cross Y, uh, where the top end is asymptotic to um, gamma plus, and the negative ends are asymptotic to gamma minus, and 
the index of the curve is 1 times gamma minus. Yes, uh, well, so index, um, so in this case, an index is virtual dimension plus 1 because uh, we're modding out by r. Yeah, gen yeah, genus zero. Yeah, genus. Yeah. So there's, um, in this paper, <coughs> Lef Berg and Talhofer define a, a more general theory where they sort of count all all holomorphic curves yeah. in here. Um, is it some finite? Thing? The sum is finite. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, this is an algebra. I, I told you what the differential of a, of a generator is. You extend it to satisfy the Leibniz rule. So this becomes differential graded algebra. So now, um, so this is the definition <coughs> as it's presented by Ali Ashberg given Talhofer. Um, the, uh, what I want to talk about, which the goal of the course, is to tell you how to define these moduli, the counts, the, the numbers in this definition. So um, up here, when I said under certain assumptions, this, um, this moduli space is, is an orbifold of this fixed dimension. Um, Basically, those, those assumptions almost very often fail in, in this example. <coughs> Yet, nevertheless, um, one is still expects that these moduli spaces to carry sort of rich enumerative structure. So I want to tell you how to, how to count these moduli spaces. So, um, so this is, OK, if you want to. Look on the archive. It's the number. Um, so the result is that such, so as as in contact homology, such moduli counts. exist, making this satisfy d squared equals 0, um, so that when you take the homology, call it contact homology of y c, is an invariant of y c. That's, is it, it doesn't depend on the choice of contact form or the choice of almost complex structure. So wha why is this called homology? I mean, it's the homology of some chain complex, but where did this chain complex come from? So here's one, one motivation for the definition. So we can look at this space of all maps from S1 to Y, which is often just called the, the loop space. Um, 
And in fact, I want a quotient by, by rotation. So it just looks at loops in y up to reparameterization, or up, up to rotation. Now there's a map um, to r given by sending uh, a, a given, given loop gamma to the integral of the contact form. So I mean, if, if you have a contact form, you can look at this, this in integral. So contact homology is, very, very roughly speaking, a version of Morse homology on this space with this, um, with respect to this function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, somehow the space of space of disjoint unions of loops. Yeah. 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 So if you <coughs> some straightforward calculation shows that the the critical points of this functional are the rape orbits, periodic orbits, and um, the gradient flow, sort of formally speaking, is exactly the pseudo-holomorphic curve equation. So this is, I mean, right, if, 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 we, if we just took the sort of the free Q vector space generated by the periodic orbits, uh, this would um, contact homology would, would exactly be sort of Morse Fleur homology for, for this function. So <coughs> some sort of one can study Morse theory on the loop space in sort of much more simple examples like this than, than this if you say take um, at this level of precision, it doesn't matter much. Um, no, it does because the critical points will be not isolated here. Yeah, yeah, the function depends on the tension from the um, Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's, yes, let's divide by. So a sort of more common form of doing Morse theory on the loop space is to just um, look at uh, the Dirichlet energy of a loop. And one can do Morse theory. This is sort of a very classical um, a technique of studying the loop space is to um, these sort of Morse homology of loop space with this functional. So but so let me say why this is why these two somehow are very different. So the the critical points of this functional are um, are closed GOD6. So maybe, yeah, maybe I want to like mod out by rotation here. Um, the critical points of these are closed GOD6. Um, but more is true. So at, at the, when you have a Morse function at the critical point, you, you look at the Hessian. So at a given closed GOD6 here, the, the Hessian is some self adjoint operator. It has infinitely many positive eigenvalues and only finitely many negative eigenvalues. And somehow very, very much related to this fact is that the downward gradient flow of, of this function called E, Dirichlet energy, um, is a parabolic PDE. Um, it's basically the heat equation. 
nonlinear linear version of it. And what this means is that um, the the initial the initial value in particular the initial value problem is well posed. If you just pick a any sort of random loop, there's a well-defined downward flow, downward gradient flow of this energy um, starting at that loop. Um, this is not the case um, for for this flow here. So the downward downward gradient flow of this function, which is usually think of A for the action functional um, is an <coughs> it's a holomorphic curve equation which is elliptic. And as a result there's no well defined downward flow. So if you start at just a random loop here, um, there's no well defined down downward flow. And so what, what, what this means is that, so the consequence is that um, when, when you do this isn't, or isn't a priori, and in fact it, it's, it's not at all, um, doesn't calculate the homology of this loop space. So if you <coughs> were just trying to study the topology of the loop space, this, this sort of version of Morse homology um, works. Um, and you can get existence theorems for closed geodesics on manifolds by um, by um, saying something about uh, the topology of the loop space and using this version of Morse more theory. Because this actually gives you some sort of cell decomposition of, of the loop space. This, this doesn't. Um, in fact, um, it depends on the contact structure you choose. Um, otherwise, it would be a sort of boring invariant. Um, but Um, I, in, in, I think it, I think it should be, but um, somehow this would be. Yeah, I haven't. I seen. think we got lost in bubbly problems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, still, it's it's been done. Like, there's a there's a Havana stable homotopy type, of, you know. So it's. I mean. Yeah, there should be some 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 sort of stable stable homotopy something you can get out of counting the the moduli spaces of higher virtual dimension, not just the ones of dimension zero. <coughs> yeah. So somehow the the reason this works is that to do to do Morse theory, you don't need um, the downward gradient flow to be well defined or to be well posed. All you need is the the problem of sort of specifying a critical point at the top and specify a critical point at the bottom and the, the space of flows to give you a well-defined moduli space. And this, this is well-defined for elliptic PDEs like this. So, um, so, so even though the downward flow isn't well-defined, we can still sort of do a version of Morse theory. So right, if, if you tried to sort of take this definition um, and d do exactly this, um, you get something called cylindrical contact homology. So, in, 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 in some cases what you can do is take um, the complex which is just sort of the free vector space generated by Q, by, by P. And take a differential which just counts oh, again 
that's just as good. Ray Warbits. So you just count holomorphic cylinders. Again, an index one in, in R cross Y. And does it mean that in this situation, the output could be not empty set, yeah? The output here. Yeah. Uh, it could be. It could be. We, we, we do, do count holomorphic planes also. Yeah, but then it seems to be, seems to be not really subcomplex in this situation. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So this is somehow a, it's, yeah, it's, this is a, this is a different, a different theory, which exists in less generality. So I, I'm, I'm going to say why this is, that this doesn't work, by this definition, in, in, in general. So, so this is somehow the, the most direct idea of taking Morse, Morse theory on the loop space and turning it to, into a homology theory. But why doesn't this work? Well, so to get a homology theory, you need the diff square of the differential to be zero. So in all these types of Morse our theories, um, one, one needs to show this. And th the reason it's true is the following. So um, <coughs> if you look at the square of the differential applied to y plus, what is this? Well, it's just counts of two-story curves, starting at y plus, going to some any curve. <laughs> Here, and, you, and then ending at y minus, gamma minus. Where these both are index one curves. So why, why should this be zero? Well, <coughs> in favor of what you want to say is that this is the boundary of the moduli space of trajectories just starting at gamma plus and ending at, at gamma minus of index 2. So this moduli space um, is generically, um, generically one-dimensional. And it gives a sort of cobordism from this moduli space to the empty set. In particular, this follows that this, this coefficient is, all, is 0. So you have a Now the problem is, this, <coughs> so this, the boundary of this moduli space has, um, has curves like this. But it doesn't only have curves like this. It also, there are, you can also have a splitting which looks like this. And so you no longer get d squared equals 0, you get d squared equals something else. So you can, you can define some sort of series of operations on this vector space where d0 gamma counts moduli spaces where you have no negative ends. d1 counts moduli spaces where you have one negative end, d2, counts moduli spaces where you have two negative ends, etc. So what this says here is somehow d1 squared is d1 squared <laughs> plus d0, d2. zero. So if, if you're if you can if you assume say there, there are no contractible ray orbits then this degeneration can't happen and cylindrical contact homology is well defined. Um, but in general um, we have to sort of count curves with one positive end and arbitrary numbers of negative ends to get a well defined homology theory.
Now the reason, and the, re the reason we can restrict to just one positive n is um, because of this maximum principle um, I talked about earlier. So if you have, um, if you have a culvert system like this, curves can't escape towards the positive end. So if you, if you start with one positive end, you can never degenerate to have more positive ends, but you can always sort of add negative ends. That's why I have to include, include all of them. Yeah, so em embedded contact homology is, is defined in, in dimension three. And in dimension three, sort of R cross Y has dimension four. And so em the condition of being embedded, so you, ha you have a sort of well-defined intersection theory between holomorphic curves in, in four dimensions. And you can <coughs> look at embedded curves and that gives you a very sort of subtle restriction on the set of curves you consider. And this gives you a different homology theory, which is isomorphic to cyber, cyber theory. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't, it's not really clear how to generalize ECH to, to higher dimensions. And there's, there's no corresponding non-triviality result for contact homology. So there's some sample applications this, this theory. So first obvious one I said earlier, if this is if this is not Q, then um, then the Weinstein conjecture holds for Y C. Obviously, there are things like distinguishing different contact structures. Um, another, another one is certifying tightness. Um, so the fact that um, the contact homology of any overtwisted manifold is zero. So, so why is this true? So, in particular, if you can calculate contact homology for something and it's not zero, then, then it's not overtwisted. So, why is this true? So, <coughs> in in any over twisted manifold. Um, um, you can find you can find a contact form and J such that there exists a rate orbit bounding exactly one. Holomorphic plane in the symplectization. So it looks like this. So the, the construction of the, so this is um, Eliasberg in dimension three. Um, Bourgeois either Kruger in dimension, um, higher dimensions. And what this tells you is that the differential of this guy is zero. So one is a boundary in this chain complex. So one equals zero in, in contact homology. So somehow all, all you need is this one local plane which exists locally in the standard um, over twisted uh, ball um, and and contact homology of anything over twisted vanishes.
So there, this is actually sort of a, a common thing which happens. Um, this sort of sh should be expected um, in symplectic contact geometry. Um, there's some class of structures or some class of problems um, which are very flexible. Um, Overtwisted contact structures is one example of that. Um, they're sort of classified completely by homotopy theoretic data. And for these sorts of flexible problems, holomorphic curves generally tell you, tell you nothing, or the sort of holomorphic inver curve invariants are, are usually trivial. And um, rigidity results in, in contact and subjective topology are often proved using, using holomorphic curves and sort of finding obstructions um, using holomorphic curves. So as, as a result, you can sort of combine these two results and conclude that the Weinstein conjecture holds for anything overtwisted. So um, this is actually due to Hofer 93 for um, for three manifolds and Alpers Hofer 2009. So Weinstein conjecture holds for over twisted. PS over twisted methods. So another another thing you can say with this is um, obstructing fillability. So if you have a contact, so if you have a symplectic cobordism from y plus to y minus. You can count holomorphic curves in the cobordism so with one positive end, the ray orbit of y plus, and of genus zero and the bunch of negative ends, the ray orbits in y minus, and you get so called cobordism map on contact homology from y plus to y minus. Um, and you notice something <coughs> interesting happens if um, if y plus is over is, is over twisted, because then if y plus over twisted, right? So if if the positive end has zero contact homology, then so does the negative end, because there's this is a unit of ring map that has to send one to one. Equals zero. In particular, if, if you're over twisted, you're not fillable because that would be a, a cobordism from your over twisted manifold to the empty set in the contact homology of the empty set is Q. Yeah, so it's an, it's an interesting question whether contact homology detects over-twistedness. If it would be sort of amazing if vanishing contact homology um, implied that you're over-twisted. Change co orientation or twisted will become again or twisted, yeah? I must, yeah. Yeah, so it means that you can, it can be filled by, from other side, which doesn't follow from this argument, yeah? 
Uh, not it, from zero, from to zero. Um, they can definitely, but uh, hmm. over twisted can definitely be capped. Yeah. Capped, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> I mean, I mean, assuming that a cap exists like topologically, but I yeah. 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 The overtwisted can be capped. Um, no, I think uh, right. Al Ashberg Murphy have this preprint like constructing com like making making cobordism symplectic, right? I think they show if I think they show if the negative end. If you have a if you have a cobordism like this, and you have sort of a contact structure here, y minus c minus. And if you have a, a formal symplectic, al almost symplectic structure here and an almost contact structure here, then you can make everything symplectic and contact, as long as the, the top boundary is non-empty. And the negative boundary is over-twisted. So then you, can, then you can just choose the positive boundary to like be a sphere and cap it with CP, CPN. Yeah, yeah, def de yeah, def definitely, definitely for tight is this is a subtle thing. But if you want to change the orientation, changing the sign of lambda, let's say, then you also change the sign of the differential of lambda. So you change the almost complex structure on xi. So it's not really the same almost. So I don't know. What happens to the caps. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is an interesting question. And the corollary of this would be that if the, if the positive end of a, of a copertism is over-twisted, then the negative end is, is over-twisted. And this is sort of widely open right now. It's known in dimension three if this is a Weinstein copertism. But this is very recent theorem of Andy Wand that Legendrian surgery in dimension three preserves tightness. Um, and it, it would follow if, if we knew this, but this seems this this would be this is a much harder harder statement apparently. And um, yeah, completely open in higher dimensions. So th there's there actually um, there's a related invariant. Um, so just an aside, if you have a Legendrian in R two n plus one. There's a related invariant Legendrian contact homology, and there, there's a related notion of um, a Legendrian being loose, as analog of overtwisted in dimensions at least five. Um, so you can, and for for loose Legendrians, the Le, the Legendrian contact homology is zero, just just um, just like this. So you can ask the same question, and and it's false. So very recent examples of Tobias Eckholm found um, Legendrians in R two n plus one, at least five, um, which are not loose, but the the Legendrian contact homology is zero. So. This is this is probably probably false in higher dimensions, but um, no examples known right now. Okay, so finally, let me give some examples of calculations of of contact homology. So. Uh, The easiest case is when you can find a contact form where all ray orbits um, have even grading, because then this um, chain complex is concentrated in even degree. The differential is degree one, so it has to vanish. So this is you can actually do this in some some cases. So Ustilovsky found 
call these even contact forms on certain Briscoe sphere, so links, links of um, isolated hypersurface singularities. Um, and, and the corollary of this is that there are infinitely many tight contact structures on S4K plus 1. Um, because you just calculate the contact homology, they're different. Of course, this also implies the Weinstein conjecture for these contact structures. You can, um, it implies a certain growth rate of the number of rape orbits for these contact structures. Every, everything, all of these sort of applications are, say something here. Um, Abru Maccarini showed um, found even contact structures um, on S2 cross S3. And again, also distinguished using contact homology. <coughs> so and, and, and many others. So there, there are many other calculations of of contact homology. Um, a lot of them happening sort of before a rigorous definition of contact homology was in place. So um, I, I believe most of them should, should work with this definition I'm going to give, but. Um, I mean, oh, there are lots of them and I haven't read them. That's, that's the, <laughs> the thing. So um, I, I think, I mean, nine, uh, like 99% should of the what's what's done should be is completely valid. I mean, I mean what, what the result I'm, I'll, I'll stay the more, more precise version of the result in a second, but it says in particular that if all the holomorphic curves are cut out transversally, then the cut counts are what you think they are. If, if you have transversality, you can calculate using those. So, um, Okay, let, let me just um, mention one more application. Um, uh, symplectic embedding capacities. So if you have uh, some open symplectic manifold, say, Some subsets so make an omega, omega one and omega two inside of R two n with the standard symplectic structure. Interesting question to ask is: Is there a symplectic embedding of one into the other? So the famous Gromov's. Non-squeezing theorem says that if you embed, want to embed, say, ball of radius r into a cylinder, then r is less than or equal to big R. So this is the sort of first evidence that this is an interesting question. Um, you can you can find a obstruction. So okay, there's an obvious obstruction. The volume this has finite volume for any finite r, and this has infinite volume, but yet there's some non-trivial um, constraint here. You can use contact homology to get other non-trivial constraints. So in the the following way, 
Um, in fact, okay, a lot of the already embedded sort of capacities um, which come from embedded contact homology are, are known and have been used a lot. Um, I think nobody's really studied contact homology ca capacities that much um, that I know of. So contact homology capacities. So if you have an embedding, say omega 1 into omega 2, you get sort of this cobordism, omega 2 minus omega 1 is a cobordism from boundary of omega 2 and the positive end to boundary of omega 1. And so on contact homology, you get a cobordism map from contact homology of the boundary of the positive domain to the, sorry? Because the boundary is um, yeah, so I guess we, yeah, so let's, yes, good. So let's, let's assume these have um, contact type boundary. Yeah, and so e each, of, each of these groups has a filtration um, by the action. That's this, this Morse function, that, not, not this Morse function, the Morse function I wrote down earlier, the integral of the contact form. Um, and this map has to, um, has to decrease action by some Stokes theorem argument. Um, and if, on the other hand, say, if these are like, say, convex domains, um, then you know the contact homology of the three sphere, and um, you know that this map has to be an isomorphism. So on the one hand, it's an isomorphism. On the other hand, it's, it decreases action. So if you can somehow calculate the action filtration on contact homology of, of these, the boundaries of these domains, uh, that gives you obstructions to, to embedding the one into the other. So. Uh, you can sort of so you can say, yeah. So for any any element of of the contact homology of say S three, you get something called a capacity which or, or say C sub y of omega, which is just the minimum action such that this element um, is represented by some rave orbits of action less than um, less than a. And this this number is sort of monotonic with respect to symplectic embeddings. Okay, um, so that's all the applications. Let me just sort of conclude by sort of stating a more, more precise version of the theorem that um, I want to sort of spend some time proving in the rest of the class. So, so for any Y lambda J, contact manifold of the contact form, and an almost complex structure, closed manifold. Um, there exists a set data, which is sort of just functorial in this input data, along with for every sort of element of that set. Um, a collection of, of numbers <coughs> for every pair. Which we just think of as the, the cardinality of this moduli space. 
such that when you form the contact homology differential using, using these much like counts, we get d squared equals 0. Um, so I need an extra condition. I need two extra conditions, because as stated, this theorem is vacuous. So first, um, the set better be non-empty. It's still vacuous because I could take all of the moduli counts to be 0. It would satisfy d squared equals 0. So, so the, the other condition I'm going to impose is just that if this moduli space is um, trans, if, if it's cut out transversally, then virtual counts are equal to the usual counts that you expect. So cut out transversely is this technical assumption you need to show that it's a manifold of the, of the expected dimension. For each yeah, for, 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 each, for each theta, for each choice of for all theta. So when, when you have a, a bunch of non-transverse, yeah, if you have if you have a single non-transverse moduli space, then its virtual fundamental class in homology is well-defined. But if you have a bunch of moduli spaces and they have boundary, and somehow the, the boundary of a given moduli space is a product of a bunch of other moduli spaces, then you can't, can't um, sort of say what these numbers are canonically. You have to make some choices, perturbation choices, and these choices um, affect what the answer you get. Um, and so the theta, theta is somehow the set of all um, perturbations you could you could make um, to make things transverse, and then this is the the resulting numbers. If if something's already transverse, you don't need to perturb it, and even if you did, you'd still get the same answer. So that's um, that's what this is saying. Um, so there there are corresponding theorems for symplectic cobordisms and for families of symplectic cobordisms. And these are necessary to like show that this is this is an um, an invariant, um, but but maybe I'll just um, state this one because the other ones are essentially essentially the same. Um, okay, so so next time um, I'll define the the moduli spaces in more detail, and I'll start the proof of this construction of fundamental cycles. Thanks.